or DNA seed experimentally. And then how many of you have analyzed the data? Okay. So I was anticipating this kind of poll, so I, I'm trying to make my uh, talk as comprehensive as possible. Also having integrated vignettes of how studies have taken into account attack seek and RNA seek data and integrated them. And I'm going to just do my best to explain what we can actually get from a toxic data, which is a little bit more complex than just gene expression. At any time, if you guys have any questions about anything that I'm talking about or just want more clarification, please. Um, the point is that uh, I'm here as a resource for those of you who want to learn more about a toxic and, and how to do things with a toxic in the future. So we're going to start with uh, the genome. So I know Sonia showed this slide yesterday and kind of glossed over a little bit of it, but I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about the important features of the genome and why the genome is the way it is. So, so DNA is two, two meters long if you stretch it, but somehow it fits inside of a six micron nucleus, which is quite amazing. And the reason why you can actually get this compaction in a small space is because you have these Okay, you have these histones, which form nucleosome structures, which are important in winding up the DNA, okay? So, a toxic in DNA-seq uh, was originally described as DNA's one hypersensitive sites. I'll talk more about the history of that on the next slide. But in, in essence, the way you want to think about a toxic in DNA-seq is that you're looking for places in the genome where you don't have these nucleosome structures, or you have this openness, right? So, we can call these open chromatin regions. And Originally, it was identified that these open chromatin regions actually had some important function. And so early investigation of these open chromatin regions in the genome showed that proteins like transcription factors tend to bind to these specific sites. <coughs> so these proteins, which have specific DNA recognition sequences, can find these open chromatin regions, bind there, and then we can rec recognize them. So that was initially how they were being looked at. Well, it was also found that these open chromatin regions can be classified into types or, or regulatory elements. So these include promoters, which are at the start of genes, where transcription initiates, and then at enhancers or long-range elements. These are, in, are DNA elements that can be very far away from the gene that they regulate. And by nature, their name, enhancers, they enhance regulation or enhance gene expression. Okay. So today, when I talk about an open chromatin region, I'm really talking about promoters or enhancers <coughs> or also silencing elements, which I'm not going to talk about just to make it simple. Okay? The other thing I'm not going to talk about is the complexity of these long-range enhancers. So we know that from work in Drosophila that these enhancers can be 20 kilobases or 20,000 bases away from the genes that they regulate. And there's an emerging and growing field in looking at the three-dimensional structure of how these enhancers regulate their genes by chromatin looping. So I'm not going to talk about the, that today. I'm really just going to talk about what do we get from these enhancer elements and promoter elements, function and activity, and then the integration with gene expression. Okay. Any questions before I move on? So like I mentioned, DNase 1 was the first enzyme, so de deoxyribonuclease 1. It's actually in, in all cells and as cells apoptose. They release DNase 1, and then that helps in the degrading process. So they use this enzyme to then look at um, digestion of, of this open chromatin DNA. So in condensed chromatin, you have this really tight structure, and the DNase 1 enzyme cannot get in there and digest these little bits, but you can treat it with DNase 1, and you have now degraded DNA. This is originally how it was done before uh, sequencing where you can add the enzyme at a concentration in different uh, low, medium, or high concentrations, and you can get different rates of digestion of your, of your chromatin, and you can visualize that on a gel. So originally, people were running these on a gel, specific to looking at targeted loci in the genome for doing analysis. One of the really nice examples of, of, of DNA swan and, and open chromatin is, is described with the beta globin locus. So beta globin is an important gene, which has very uh, many subunits. Uh, in erythroid cells, and what was discovered by DNase 1, uh, this is the actual experiment that described this locus control region, so it's a set of uh, seven enhancers that act 50,000 base pairs upstream of the gene that it regulates. 
After DNA swan, they were able to describe that each of these seven components had a role in, you know, in enhancing the expression of these subunits downstream. So that was this was one of the earliest discoveries of, of mammalian long-range uh, enhancers, and it's now known through many many studies um, and many different biochemical assays that these uh, that this locus of control actually mediates gene gene expression control via looping mechanisms. Okay. So here we're, I'm taking into account enhancers of the open chromatin regions, the genes, which we know are expressed, so you can capture that by RNA-seq, and then the looping, right? So the mechanism by which these enhancers regulate their genes in this large structure. So thankfully, with the advent of sequencing, all you had to do was do DNAs on your whole genome, then you can add adapters and then run them on a sequencer. And there have been many, many methods uh, for profiling different features of the genome. So we're going to talk about DNA-seq and ATAC-seq. And these use uh, two different enzymes. So DNA-seq uses the dna one enzyme. ATAC-seq uses the TN5, which is a transposome, transposome, which acts in attagmentation. So as it goes in and digests or inserts itself into open places, it includes attagmentation for easy library building, which is kind of um, been really interesting and really important in, in sequencing in general. We have these other methods called ChIP-seq, which looks at transcription factor-specific identification of binding, and that's through an antibody enrichment. And then there's these other, so MD-seq uses a micrococal nuclease to look at the nucleosome structures that I talked about, and then FAIR-seq, which uses formaldehyde-assisted kind of digestion, which has been shown to look at open chromatin, but it's very noisy. So, we're going to stick with the TACSEQ and DNA-seq for, for the rest of this talk. So in the beginning, DNA-seq was something that uh, I, I've also done it myself, required millions and millions of cells. Um, and the titration of the enzyme was actually very, very important, which made it difficult to do. Um, and thankfully, with uh, a TACSEQ in 2013, this enabled people to now start doing experiments with very few cells. And at the end of today, I'm going to talk about single cell ataxic and, and where that's going as well. So there are a few things that we can get from ataxic in general. Okay? When the transposome goes and inserts itself, you can get these two kinds of readouts. You're going to get long nucleosome fragments, so these fragments that span multiple nucleosome structures. And then you're going to get these short fragments. This, is, uh, this image is showing these would be the short fragments where you would have transcription factors bound to those specific sites. Okay? So let's say we do an experiment with 50,000 cells and we do a TACSEQ. The first thing we get are sequencing reads, right? So these go through your standard QC, however you would like to trim them. And the first step is really mapping to the genome, okay? And this, I, I've included some tools for every step here. Uh, these are tools that I've used and um, are available if you guys like just uh, have them just so you guys know that these tools exist. Um, and, and what you will first find is that uh, you can start to see that there's some particular structure in, in how these reads map to the genome, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in, in, in a little bit. But like I mentioned, the two uh, important readouts that we get are these long nucleosome DNA fragments and the short DNA fragments. And if you actually map the fragment length distribution, you can actually kind of see that. So here are these short fragments. These are the longer fragments, and you can see that there's some nucleosome spanning fragments. Okay? So what's kind of cool about a TACSEQ is that if you're interested in looking at nucleosomal patterns, right? if you want to compare how the nucleosomes uh, are aligned between different species or within different conditions, you can actually restrict yourself to looking at these nucleosomal patterns. And in Shep et al., um, they showed that uh, they, when comparing a seq with endase, so endase is the application for specifically getting micrococal nucleus, so the, the, uh, the uh, nucleosome fragments, uh, with a seq you can actually recapitulate those results quite nicely. So what's kind of cool is you're, you're not just getting open chromatin where the proteins are bound, but you're also getting nucleosome information, which is something that you can look at. Any questions on that before I continue? So like I mentioned, um, when you start to map the reads of the genome, you start to see that there's a pile of, of, of reads. And so essentially, there's this uh, signal construction. So most of what you guys have seen probably in papers are these peaks, right? So essentially, you're, you're now 
modifying this to, to now look as an actual signal that has a quantitative value or a metric, right? And so you can visualize your, your data using browsers or generate your own browser if you like. But if we think about what this actually means, we're getting reads that tell us the accessibility of all 50,000 cells that are accounted by the reads. But what's most interesting is that that's actually, the, most of the information that we care about is also here, right? So this information. So we know that these regions are accessible, but there's something interesting about the sequence that allows this region to be important or accessible. And so the first thing that you want to do is you want to call peaks. So essentially there are different peak callers that one can use. Um, and so we go from reads to a signal propagation to then peaks that give us some confidence to how many reads are supported in, of that peak. And you can see that in this ar arbitrary example, you can have this peak that has 100 reads covering it and this one has 10 reads covering it. So now you're, you're going back to a count table essentially that, that somebody talked about in the gene expression. So, that's kind of how you can now do differential comparisons if you have the same, uh, this, these four peaks in another sample, you can compare 100 to the other sample and you can start to do differential, right? So that's the quantitative aspect of, of this by assessing that there's a difference in the accessibility of that peak with condi cross conditions. So uh, as an example to show kind of how I think about a toxic when I have to analyze it, um, from my PhD work, I did a differentiation between myeloid cells and, and profiled by a toxic uh, along the differentiation from this progenitor. And in this really uh, simple example, I'm showing here uh, chromatin accessibility for the progenitor, macrophages in, in red, monocytes in green, another macrophage subtype in green, and then neutrophils in blue. And uh, I'm showing here three representative loci where this loci shows a macrophage specific neutrophil specific, so these are cell type specific uh, open chromatin regions. And then this last one, which actually shows kinetics or dynamics of open chromatin. So as these cells differentiate, there's an increase in the open chromatin accessibility of, these, of this promoter specifically. So this is kind of looking at, at, at it from this perspective, right? Where we know that there's a difference, but if you want to be, you want to be more quantitative and more robust in these, you can actually do kinds of differential analysis, right? If you want to look at temporal dynamics, you want to compare not only between cell conditions, but maybe between time points. You want to look at how these open chromosome regions are changing across time. So um, I actually use Mossack Pro, um, and Mossack Pro is quite robust in, in capturing some of these clusters, unique clusters. And so here I now have resolved all of the open chromatin across the genome into these 13 clusters that have these specific patterns of accessibility. So revisiting back kind of this, this initial observation, what's quite nice about coupling what you see by visualization and also by clustering or by dynamic profiling, is that you can go back to this loci and see that there's specific patterns that can emerge within a single kind of loci. For, the, for example, we can see that uh, we have four different open chromatin regions that we're looking at. And uh, from this clustering analysis, I found that this blue one and this blue one fall within the same cluster, but this, these two per neighbor ones are falling in a different cluster. The reason why they're falling in different clusters is because of the accessibility of this secondary macrophage. So within the same loci, I can distinguish patterns for, for how genes may be potentially regulated based on the dynamics of the open chromatin, based on the open chromatin state. And then here's one that's specific to neutrophils, and then this cluster is looking at the temporal dynamics. So coupling the signal construction or signal analysis with peak calling and then quantitative measurements of clusters um, is important. And I think it's, it's going to be something that you will do in the beginning of your analysis so that you can look at how these open chromosome regions are specific or are changing across your different conditions. Are there any questions on this before I move on? So I, I, I focused on looking at the read information that supports the peaks, right, signal propagation. I've looked at peaks, right, individual units. Um, but again, we're looking specifically at DNA. So within these peaks, there's some information that's also very useful. So we know that uh, from the example that I showed at the beginning that proteins or transcription factors tend to bind to these locations, which render it accessible. 
And actually, with uh, motif enrichment or motif discovery analyses, you can actually look at the significance of enrichment uh, of, 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 of motifs that may be present in these open chromatin regions. Right? So for, in this case, uh, we see the example of a particular transcription factor called CTCF, which is an insulator protein, which has a unique sequence that it binds to, comparing with ELF1, which has a shorter sequence. So these transcription factors have very specific DNA recognition sequences that they can that they bind to. I will talk about this transcription factor footprinting on a few slides, but I want to focus more on on how these analyses are actually informative and, and some of the technical considerations when doing motif enrichment analysis. So um, to go back to how transcription factors work. Here's an example uh, from this really nice review. I recommend those who are interested in, in understanding more about transcription factors looking at this Lambert et al. review, uh, which does a really, really nice dissection of, of transcription factor biology um, and, and the function of transcription factors. So a transcription factor has these DNA binding domains, which are going to recognize a sequence. And so these, this TFBS, which is a trans, transcription factor binding sequence, is, is present here. And this is the open chromatin region. Right, to kind of tie everything back together. We know that transcription factors have uh, regulatory activities such as ligand binding domains or can activate proteins, uh, can also recruit changes in the uh, epigenetics of, of neighboring histones. And there's quite a few transcription factors. Right? And they've all been described based on their DNA binding families. And each of these factors are expressed across different cell types, and they have different important regulatory functions. Any questions? Okay. So one really nice example that we've been able to do is uh, profiling uh, ataxies in 86 primary immune cell types. Um, we did just kind of a basic motif analysis across uh, 300,000 regions in the genome that we identified. And this is scanning for motifs across the entire peak, right? So if we consider an open chromatin region to be 250 base pairs, we're looking for the most significant enrichment of a motif present. And what you can see is that there are really nice blocks that, so this black clustering shows there was really nice blocks of motifs that uh, align with the presence uh, within a particular lineage. So for example, you can have uh, P1 represented in the macrophage and granulocytes. You can have left represented, or, left represented in the T cells, you can have Pax5 represented in the B cell cluster, and you can now start to see which transcription factor motifs are present in the respective cell lineages. So this is scanning for the motif presence within the entire peak itself. The alternative is actually footprinting. And so footprinting was originally described um, in yeast, actually, where they So uh, footprinting was actually described in yeast. Um, and in this example, I'm going to explain how footprinting actually works. So uh, in this study, um, they wanted to show how footprinting can be useful and can be complementary to other methods like chip seek. So in this example, they did a, a chip seek. So this is enrichment for a particular transcription factor um, and then by immunoprecipitation. And they mapped its binding to this particular promoter. Okay? They did DNA seq for the same cell type and found that there was a nice open chromatin state that follows that really nicely. Now, computationally, instead of mapping the entire read, if you only map the first nucleotide position of that read, what you'll get is individual base pair coverage. The reason why this is interesting is that if you can imagine um, my hand, my arm has DNA, when the protein binds to the DNA and you add the DNAs, you'll get cutting on the ends on the opposite sides of where the protein is bound. But you protect the sequence where the DNAs cannot insert itself or cannot cut. And these actually form these nice little indentations which are resolved as footprints. So in this example, they zoom in and see that there's this really nice footprint which matches the conservation. So this site is conserved across vertebrates and actually follows the recognition sequence for NRF1. So they're able to infer this NRF1 footprint with, from the DNA-seq data, but show that NRF1 chip-seq also supports it, right? 
So now you can start to see, well, if you don't have chip seek for your factor of interest, maybe you could use a DNA seq or a toxic data to infer the binding of that factor based on this kind of analysis. And this really nice example, here's kind of uh, the, the logic for how you could use this information. So here I'm showing four different cell types, uh, lymphocytes, neuronal cells, B cells, and hepatic cells, the liver cells. And they show the, the gene DGF. What they show is the DNA seq coverage. So this is at a single nucleotide coverage. And we can focus on the specific footprint here for this factor NRSF. So NRSF is a neuronal repressor. So it's expressed in non-neuronal cells. So you don't want neuronal cells to be expressed in your T cells or in your B cells. So this NRSF goes there and binds to these sites. And by the footprints, you can see that it's present in hepatic cells, B cells, and T lymphocytes but it's no longer expressed in neuronal cells, so its footprint is essentially lost. And so you, by gene expression, you can see that BGF is not expressed wherever you have NRSF, and you lose the NRSF footprint, and now you have expression. Right? So now you can start to think of, okay, well, I have a toxic, I, I can build, I can look at footprints for many transcription factors, I have gene expression, you can start to connect the dots and say, well, can we build networks or can we start to infer regulatory networks from this data? But that's essentially what they did. Um, so John Stam was originally the first one to start looking at these transcription factor footprints. And I kind of also wanted to do that with the Toxic in, in my system by looking at myeloid differentiation. And uh, the way that uh, we did this is kind of similar, but a little bit different. And I'll specify the differences. So first of all, they use DNA-seq, where I use the toxic, the, so the methodology to allow for less, less input, less cell input. Secondly, um, they looked at um, transcription factor footprints within five kilobases, within 5,000 bases of the promoter, uh, whereas I restricted myself to about 20 kb. <coughs> the reason why I went to 20 kilobases is that I knew that there was a specific set of enhancers that were 15,000 base pairs upstream of the genes that I was interested in. So I, I increased my window size to include those, uh, those binding sites in my analysis. Secondly, um, they are comparing cell types uh, between human and mouse. So they wanted to look at the conservation of these networks um, between human and mouse, where I was interested in looking at the dynamics of how these networks were evolving uh, over differentiation, comparing uh, neutrophil monocyte and macrophage differentiation. So uh, really nicely they show, if you want to look at this paper, uh, the citation is here, but I, I guess I can't even see it myself. Um, <coughs> they, they were able to compare the regulatory networks between human and mouse and show that there's a 95% conservation of these regulatory circuits, which is quite a, a nice analysis. In my case, I restricted myself to transcription factors that were expressed in my system. Uh, this study en encompassed all potential transcription factors, uh, whereas I was specifically looking at factors that I knew were dynamic and were important to my regulatory. So this is more targeted. This is kind of more global, right? So there are two different ways that one can approach network building. One can be, let's take everything possible, and one can be more tailored or more targeted, depending on the questions you would like to ask. The reason why I decided to focus on transcription factors that were expressed in my system is because um, there's an important technical aspect of motif analysis and footprinting. So I showed earlier that many transcription factors fall into these families. These families are recognized by the type of motif or the type of sequence. So a lot of these transcription factors have very similar motifs. Right? So how do you distinguish from 25 different regulators, which factor is actually down there if you're just using the sequence information. So this showed, uh, so this uh, review did a motif uh, similarity analysis using the piercing correlation coefficient to show that indeed these transcription factors tend to cluster together. Right? As an example, this study here did a really comprehensive molecular and, and uh, analytical dissection of the X factor transcription factor family and they report that while they were able to classify some differences between the S motifs for, for certain regulators, they still couldn't get fine detailed resolution without additional information like uh, PDMs or chip seek data. So it's difficult to resolve from the motif alone which of these ETS or 
uh, elk family members is truly bound there. So one way you can do that is you can leverage the expression. You could say, if x5, is, if x1 and 2 are not expressed, this x motif is probably not coming from the x transcription factor. It's probably coming from another factor. So you can actually stratify or rank which factors are likely predicted to be bound, bound there. So uh, from, our, from our study, uh, we actually took into account these, these kinds of uh, difficulties or technical considerations. And so instead of now just looking at the motifs, what we used was we mapped the expression patterns of the transcription factors, and then we correlated them with the change in the accessibility across all the different 86 immune populations. So now we're taking into account the active or oppressive nature of these transcription factors based on how the accessibility tracks for all lineages. And what you can find is some really nice clusters. So um, we included the transcription factor as the expression and then its motif, because we know that certain TFs have specific uh, motifs that are defined by JASPAR or CISPP databases. And uh, you can resolve quite nicely some uh, stem cell uh, transcription factors like GATA, um, CVP, uh, family members that are regulators but also have the motifs and that have positively correlated with positively correlated within the granulocyte lineages. And so taking into account the accessibility dynamics, the expression dynamics in motif uh, accessibility allows you to target and, and fine prune uh, which motifs are present in your analyses. Any questions before I move on? So uh, one of the other important things about footprinting um, is that the DNA swan and the transposon um, actually has a bias. So there's a sequence bias that these uh, enzymes impose on the DNA itself. So when you do footprinting, you really need to correct for these biases. Um, it's been shown in some studies, it usually ends up in the supplementary, but you can see that uh, when you don't have this correction, you have a different profile that's actually the profile of the enzymes themselves and not of the transcription factors themselves. Um, and so the DNase one has a, around a five base pair uh, bias. Uh, the transposon has a nine base pair insertion bias. Uh, there are two methods that really help in, in uh, adjusting these. One is from uh, hint attack from Leodol and then a seek out bias from this uh, Martins et al. and acids research. So in the hands-on, I'll be talking more about hint and, and footprinting as a, as a way to do it. I think that the field of footprinting, um, I, still do, I still think there's a lot more work to be done, and, and especially taking into account the biases that exist. So in this example from this paper, um, they looked at DNA seq data and uh, ataxi data from the same, or from the same uh, cell types. So GM128 and K562, and they find that there's an agreement between both assays for most factors, but you can see that in some cases, certain assays will resolve footprints more, more specifically than others, right? So for example, YY1 seems to be more of an ataxic uh, enriched footprint, whereas D seems to be more of a DNA enriched um, footprint. So we know that the kinetics of the enzymes are also different, which is probably uh, showing the variation in these footprints. So, so taking into account this footprint analysis, it's good to understand the, the potential limitations and issues when you're considering these kinds of analyses, when you want to say uh, that, uh, that this is a truly a representative footprint of GMD. And I, Gordon Hager and many others have, have looked at modeling the activity of how transcription factors bind to DNA in, in looking at uh, rates of um, binding on and off kind of kinetics uh, for mapping these kinds of uh, features. Any questions on, on the bias? Okay. So I guess this is like bias towards this is which Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, so Gordon showed that uh, from some molecular cell papers uh, that AP1 transcription factors have very weak footprints because they have a higher on-off rate. Whereas factors like CTCF, which have a really long motif, have a long residency time. So they sit on DNA longer, so the footprints tend to be more robust. You also have to remember the, that these footprints are an aggregate, an aggregate across all, all of the cells, right? 
So if you measure 50,000 cells, you're actually looking at the potential footprints from all 50,000 cells in aggregate or all sites in aggregate, right? So being able to look at footprints uh, within smaller numbers of cells may be a, a difficult thing to do. Right? So you may have to rely on additional information like ChIP-seq or Motif or, or things that, that aren't available yet. Questions? So do you have a feel for quantitative effect of the bias in that network if you don't do this correction? Of course, it depends on the factor, but are we talking about 5 10 percent of the network, or is it half of the wiring that sort of will be affected? How big is the effect? Um, so the, the effect is greater, greater felt if you want to compare, um, if you want to look at footprints of a particular factor between different conditions, or if you want to see if there's an, a, an additional structure that you're not observing, if you don't normalize, you lose those features, right? So if you have a transcription factor like PAX that's bound to a specific site and you want to know, in these sets of open chromatin regions, what does the PAX footprint look like? What about in these? What does it look like? Is there a difference? Could there be cofactors? If you don't normalize with the transposon uh, bias, you, you can't resolve those differences. And actually doing true differential footprinting is something that's hard to do. So how do you compare uh, the, the kinetics or differences at, of, of footprints. And I think that would have a tremendous impact on the networks. So false negatives. Is yeah, one. false negatives. That's a big thing with, with uh, footprinting is a false negative rate. And do you have any false positive coming from this bias in the, like a blacklist of motifs that are derived from this bias in the TM5? Yeah, you can, so there's so very GC rich motifs would be, would be biased, so, and, and that's actually relevant because SP factors are, are GC rich. So there are also tra some transcription factor motifs that would be a huge false positive in, in this analysis, which is why leveraging uh, expression data and, and maybe the biology is also important, right? So not just kind of an agnostic analysis, but something that's maybe somewhat supervised in a sense. One more question. What happens when you have clusters of transcription factors binding tightly? How do you resolve this yeah. structure from just looking at the ends? Because in this case, you have to look at the whole open chromatin. Yeah. Um, I would say that in mammals, there have been, been really good examples of this. I think in Drosophila, um, the examples are much more clearly defined for neighboring enhancers or enhancer elements that are neighboring to each other. I think in the mammalian system, it's, it's quite complex, and we still don't understand a lot of literature from the stem cell, like uh, Rick Young and uh, Rudolf Pienisch, those, those, you know, those groups have really focused on like three transcription factors that sit together, ox, ox, and nanog. But they've been using ChIP-seq. Uh, they haven't looked at footprinting. It might be nice to go back and ask, from the footprinting, can you recover those yeah. kinds of uh, those kinds of positions? But yeah, I mean, those, those questions are still out there. Okay, so moving on just a little bit. Um, so we've been talking about, just to recap, signal, right, accessibility, how accessible is the site across the ensemble of cells. Uh, we've been talking about these as peaks themselves so we can quantitatively characterize the differences. We can look at uh, the motifs, right, the underlying DNA sequence that gives you information about why this is an open chromatin region. We can infer footprints from many transcription factors to build predictive networks or infer networks, right? So already from this, there's, there's a lot of different types of data and different types of questions that you can ask with the taxi that I think Gene Expression isn't able to, to give you. Now, the two things that I really want to focus in the next couple of minutes is distinguishing activity and function. Okay. So I've been talking about a, a taxic and, and uh, being accessible as a state of, of what the nature of the DNA is. Okay. And there's features that drive that. So the transcription factors that bind there, the printing, how accessible it is. But what about fun, what about activity? Okay. So um, there have been some assays to actually measure how active a, a regulatory element is. Okay. And so. Um, from Alex Stark's group, they developed this, this star, uh, star sequence self-transcribing active regulatory region sequencing. 
So the idea is that you have uh, arbitrary input DNA, so this can be genome-wide, fragments of DNA. But you can actually use a taxi your DNA inputs, right? So you can have your open, open chromatin regions from your data and ask, well, are these active in any sense? And use them as an input. And essentially, you're going to clone them in so that you can ask for uh, whether these open chromatin regions have any function in, in transcribing expression, so that, as a reporter assay. So now you're measuring the activity of these enhanced, so these open chromatin regions to ask, do they have activity in specifying gene expression? Now there are certain limits to this in that uh, the promoter of these uh, <laughs> reporter systems is important. You're taking the enhancer or the open chromatin region out of the context of the genome. Um, so there's a lot of things to consider, <coughs> but it's one way you can start to now ask questions of activity. And uh, in these examples, uh, they did star seek in different cell types and found that uh, specific open chromatin regions have uh, cell type specific activity, right? So not just accessibility, but actual activity uh, as measured by, uh, by RNA and cell. Okay? Um, one of the limits to this is that uh, it requires many, many cells. Uh, it's something you have to uh, transfect into cells, so it's, you can't do this in vivo. Um, it's mainly cell line restricted, but it starts to give you some information about regulatory element activity. Some other examples, just to illustrate. Um, so Fuko uh, et al. did a CRISPR-I uh, to measure uh, differences in activity, and what, what CRISPR-I is is that it's a CRISPR interference. So uh, you, you target uh, enhancer elements, or you block the activity of enhancers using this CRISPR, this modified CRISPR. Grossman et al. did a TF motif targeting screen. Z et al. did mosaic seq for 70 enhancers to, to look at uh, perturbing 70 enhancers and how that functions, gene expression. And then it's not shown here, but Ernst et al. did a very targeted specific analysis called um, uh, Shaper MPRA, so Shaper Massively Parallel Reporter Assay, where they dissect a single open chromatin region and then tile uh, essentially looking at the activity of, of that enhancer. <coughs> So you, you can start to look at activity, you can start to think about how do you, do you have a particular open chromatin region bound by a factor that you really care about, how can you start to measure activity, how can you look at whether or not it's functionally important, right? So along with function, um, how do you know if this open chromatin region is more important than this open chromatin region? Well, one thing you can say is, this is more highly represented in most of the cells, whereas this one is probably not as highly represented in most of the cells that you're capturing. Um, and one of the really nice examples um, for, for looking at enhancer function um, is shown from Sasha Rudensky's group, where they focused on this FOXP3 gene, which is a transcription factor that's restricted to expression in Tregs. Um, and they looked within the gene and found that there was these really interesting uh, sites that were highly conserved. So here's a promoter, which is conserved across all of these species. They found this CNS1, CNS2, and CNS3. So these are uh, conserved non-coding sequences. And what they did was they generated mouse knockouts for each one. Um, and just to summarize, what they found was that actually this enhancer here has a dramatic, dramatic impact on T regulatory cell function. So if you knock out the CNS2 enhancer, you lose Tregs, you lose the ability to express FOXP3. Okay. Now, so this is a really nice example where they found uh, uh, an enhancer that actually has a function in, in terms of the cell. Well, this study here, what they did was they characterized 20 enhancers by H3K27 acetylation. So this is a mark for enhancers of histones. They looked at open chromatin accessibility. They saw that they were conserved. They did uh, complete deletions, so dual guide RNA deletions uh, for, for looking at limbs. And in all 20, they found no phenotype. Okay. This shows that there's a level of robustness that's employed across the entire genome. Right? So you can have these properties, these features of open chromatin that can be enhancers. But if you de delete this single enhancer, there's no effect on the actual phenotype of the limb itself. <coughs> However, this study then went on and said, well, maybe it's not a single enhancer, but what if we delete two together? Does that affect the actual expression or regulation? 
And actually, you can see that uh, when they did this dual guide RNA deletion for both enhancers, they found that there's a malformation in the digit. So you get an extra digit to form. Okay? The other thing that you'll note is that this enhancer is 120,000 bases away upstream of the gene, and this one is 86,000 base pairs downstream of the gene. I don't, they didn't say how many other enhancers were in between, right? Because you can imagine that this might be the 100th enhancer away, or this could be the 100th enhancer away, right? So there's a level of complexity here that's quite, quite, uh, quite difficult to navigate through. So I, in one, yeah? Um, did they, where, did they just pick two at random, or did they try many, or? It's the two they reported. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you can imagine that there are probably a lot of, you know, I probably have to see this result. I don't know, I'd say, I don't know how the paper came, but I, I can imagine after seeing this result, they're like, whoa, okay, nothing. So maybe let's start doing them in combinations. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what other information went into this, what other features they might have considered. Um, maybe transcription factor binding was something they looked at. Maybe they did many, many, and then just reported the ones that did work. Um, but in all this, this really does tell you that there's a lot of redundancy, right? Which makes it difficult to then assess function, right? So if we start with a, a 300,000 open chromatin regions, we can start to then ask, okay, how many of them do, you, do we think are actually important for the cell function, for, for cell stability, cell differentiation, all these different kinds of biological processes, right? So it's an interesting problem. I think it's a very complex problem. It's why most of us are studying these kinds of <laughs> these kinds of things. Um, so yeah, any, uh, any questions? No, but it makes sense that it's redundant system because because in biology you cannot lift the, the development only to one or or a couple of the hunters or promoters. You need to be balanced to, to control it. So it's a complexity, but it makes sense in the sense of the biology and the evolution. So it's something that. At least, if you came from biology, you take it into account. Of it, in one sense, I, I agree with you, and in another sense, there are these examples that exist, right? So one enhancer really does damage everything, whereas two, and there are other there are other papers that where they do two and find no effect, but it's the third one, right? Yeah. So we don't really understand this kind of synergy or cooperativity, which makes which make it difficult but interesting. Is it always that you assume a positive influence of transcription yeah. factor? Is it? <clears throat> so, if you assume that these are enhancers, right? So that would be that you, that if you would um, the lead you would have a down regulation in gene expression, right? Because enhancers seem to find. But all of these uh, attacks, they, they you always assume that there's a positive. No, there could be. There could yeah. Be, yeah. It could be negative. Because the more the examples you show are positive. Yeah, uh, so there are some repressors, but I, people tend to focus more on the enhancement of expression versus the repressive nature of, of, of expression. Mm -hmm. But there, there, are, there are some studies that have looked at open chromatin regions where the repressors are found there. So if you delete the open chromatin region, you have active, so mm -hmm. a deep repression yeah. of, of expression. But you assume that there is many, many more uh, yes. activators. Yes, yes. There is no study on that study. Um, I think there are some that have been done in Drosophila. Mm -hmm. So I think mm, Levine's group have looked at repression of these elements. So repressor elements instead of enhancer elements, and how if you do, you know you delete an, a repressor, you actually have abnormal expression which you shouldn't have. Um, so yeah, I think it's just more common to study the positive versus the negative. But they, but these studies do exist. If you look at, if you look in the field for Levine's work, you'll see a lot of that. With the number of activators, isn't that like 50, 50 in general? I don't know what the numbers are. No, but I mean, <laughs> after, well, it's, not, it's not that 9 to 10, or? I think, I mean, so understanding whether transcription factors have an activator or a repressor role, I think is, for some factors, still not known, mm -hmm. right? Um, for example, FOXP3, we know that it has potentially a dual function. So as an act, works as an activator, works as a repressor. Maybe in some factors we're just stabilizing. Right? So yeah, the stability, I'm not sure, it sways one way or another. Questions? Okay. Um, <clears throat> 
So, so I talked about attack seek in general. I talked about um, the activity, uh, the function, and then these examples. And clearly, I'm, there are many, many, many more examples that I'm not illustrating, but uh, that are that are present. This is just to kind of open the the thought process for how one should think about a taxi analysis and, and heavy integrative analysis. So I'm going to talk about um, how we've been integrating a taxi with gene expression in this, uh, what I've already showed in the um, open chromatin data from the immune, immune cells. So I've been fortunate enough to be part of the ImGen, which is a you know, electrical genome project. Um, and I'm going to be just talking about the chromatin and the uh, RNA-seq data that's on here. But ImGen really serves as a really nice resource. Um, in that it actually profiles immune cells, uh, primary immune cells from the mouse. And we sort the cells, we know what markers they express. Um, so it's not uh, a list of cell lines, but these are, are real cells that, uh, that one can care about. And there has been uh, many, many different platforms of looking at uh, the profiling, not just in gene expression, but looking at uh, differential splicing, genetic variation, cytokine, and there's really much more to come. Uh, from Imgen, so uh, I would highly recommend if you're interested in looking at some data to play with or, or start to investigate, this is a great place to start for looking at uh, primary immune cells. So um, this is a, a work that's in review from uh, Hideyuki, who's a postdoc in our lab, who's now at the Ricken, uh, where he generated this really comprehensive and very rigorous um, attack seek. So this was done in biological triplicates. Uh, all the cells were sorted uh, using the same operating procedure, the same SOP, so in the morning at 9 a.m. Um, very, very rigorous. And then for each uh, biological replicate of the attack seek, they, we also looked at um, RNA-seq using uh, ultra-low input RNA-seq with 1,000 cells. Um, and you can see that there's a, a quite uh, comprehensive view of the immune system. So we can start from stem cell populations through DC, macrophage, granulocyte, derived from um, hematopoietic stem cells, but then there's also some macrophages from microglia, the red pulp, uh, the lungs. Um, you can see the ILCs, NK cells. And really one of the nice uh, features to this data set is that we can actually look at differentiation series. So this T cell differentiation, this is B cell differentiation and capture this kind of the entire differentiation uh, series. So this is a really nice data, data set. It's a really rich resource, and I'm going to talk about some of the, the things that we um, that we did, and also some of the components that uh, we hope the community to be able to look at as well and also build upon. So not just a resource that's published, but a resource with many, many, many. Um, documents that then you can actually go and look for the data through the data yourself, look at the motif enrichments across all the OCRs, look at um, some of the correlation analysis that we did, so then you can do some guided analysis. So we hope to keep this not something that just ends up as a supplemental table forever and not, never used, but something that continues to live on, and actually yeah, something that I'm using in my studies in the future. So this is what the data looks like. Uh, here I'm showing three representative loci. Here's the myeloid specific loci for this is, this is the P1 enhancer, which we see it's uh, very restricted in the granulocyte lineages. And here on the, this uh, histogram on the side shows the gene expression. We can see T cell specific for the CD8 loci, for well-known described enhancers. Uh, we can see ubiquitous, so things uh, at HBR, a promoter of HPRT is uh, accessible across all of the, all of the, the cells. And so you, there's a rich resource here that, that can be explored. So one of the things that we started thinking about was how do we use the open chromatin accessibility and gene expression together, right? And um, one thing you can do is you can take, for example, this gene SAMD3 and then ask, Within 100 kilobases, which OCRs tend to have a positive correlation or a negative correlation? Here, in this case, it's a positive correlation. And we can start to see that there are certain open chromatin regions that have accessibility and gene expression across the entire data set. So these correlations are computed by taking into account all of the data, not just some of the data, but the entire, uh, the entire data set. In the inverse, you can take correlations between expression and the activity of strongly associated distal uh, OCRs for a thousand genes. Right? So you can take uh, 
a gene-centric or a regulatory element-centric kind of approach to, to start to build these links between uh, open chromatin regions and the genes that they can potentially regulate. So this is just the distribution of how many correlated OCRs per gene. Um, this is within 100 kilobases, and this is a Bonferroni adjusted uh, correction. Um, and so we can see that there are uh, many genes that have no um, correlated OCR, but we can find that some genes can have up to more than 20 correlated OCRs. One example of that is shown for the interleukin 7 receptor. So here what we're showing is the open chromatin on the bottom, and then the cis OCR correlations on the top, where we have the adjusted p value on the y axis, which gives you the significance of the correlation. And then uh, the, where that, this matches where the OCR actually is. And so um, the red links show the OCRs that have a correlation with interleukin 7R, and then the black bar for other genes. And so for every gene that's expressed, we have the most highly correlated, positively and negatively correlated OCRs. So if you want to look at potential repressive, uh, repressor-like correlations, we can, we can actually look at that as well. So this is one thing that we provide in the resource. So it's quite nice. So you can build upon these correlations and integrate it with other data as well. Any questions? Can you do the same without restricting yourself to 100 KB to look at correlation between the action factor and access where we can separate the genome to see these links. So we, we so uh, Sarah Mustafabi who did the this social correlation, she extended it to one megabasis, but it, it gets messier the further away you go. Um, and so we restricted it to 100 kb with the assumption that uh, within a tad boundary, kind of within some biological boundary, that we could see that. But what I mean is, if you take the expressed action factors and then you look at how many chromatin accessory regions are. I use this rationale to kind of build links between transition factor identity and yeah. identity without restricting to the to particular place in the genome. Yeah, I mean you can you can compute correlations across the entire genome or across the chromosome, yeah. right? So taking into account the uh, restriction of within the chromosome, and then you can you can do this analysis. But we restricted ourselves to 100 yeah, yeah. kb for this for the sake of the study. Where we also have motif information for each of these sites. So within these 20 links, we can ask, well, which is there a transcription factor that's sitting at all 20 links, right? So the fact that you started to look at the whole data set with the OCRs and expression, is that the reflection of that most OCRs and genes are very similar across the cell type and they're just subtle differences? I mean, an alternative view would be that there are very sort of specific for the specific cell types, or maybe the differences are very subtle since it works to look at the whole data sets. Yeah, so one of the things that we, we can see even in this example is that uh, this is a long T cell differentiation, right? And you can see that these OCRs that are correlated seem to fall in these blocks. Yeah. So they fall within these kind of lineage blocks, which tells you that there's some additional, there's some structure, right? So you have a level of resolution within your lineage differentiation, but then when you're comparing across <coughs> the T cells and B cells, you get these blocks right. that can form. <clears throat> which gives you additional structure of chromatin accessibility, so which is quite nice. Hierarchy. Correct. So that's what that's what makes this kind of analysis nice is that you can go to the meta cell, right? So a meta cell being that you describe all T cell accessibility or all B cell accessibility as one, but then within that block you can look at the resolution of how those dynamics are changing. So we tend there there seems to be some higher order structure that that follows quite nicely. So I've read some papers where they not only look at accessibility, but also at the shape of the peak. Ah, yeah. And they try to infer some regulatory properties. Yeah. Um, I guess that with this data set, you could see shapes of the peaks and in differentiation. Yeah, we, we did. Um, we, we talked about looking at shape, shape profiles. Um, but we ended up not looking at that shape in the end. Um, I, I think we don't have enough depth. So the, the data is sequenced uh, to about 10 to 20 million reads, so depth, the shape would be nice with deeper data. Um, it could resolve some things, and I think for uh, looking at nucleosome structure and the shape at the promoters would be very interesting, but it's something we didn't have time to get to. Do you have any comments on this type of analysis? Looking at it, I mean, do you have any experience with this shape? With shape? Uh, no, the only shape stuff I've done is with footprinting. 
and um, I've learned a lot about where footprinting is and what needs to be done. I think, and I think there are new analytical methods that, that will be described for that in the future. Any other questions? Okay, so one of the analysis that, uh, that I was focused on uh, was mapping. I had a very simple question. Uh, this is going back to FOXB3, which is that transcription factor that I was talking about earlier. Uh, so FOXB3 is primarily restricted to expression in Tregs, which is this red line here. So I had a very simple question. It was, uh, if I take FOXB3 bound sites <coughs> in T regulatory cells, and given that I have the entire differentiation series, can I look back into the history of the accessibility of that, that bound site and ask, well, are there any kinetics or any dynamics of these sites over the course of differentiation? Uh, so I, I looked at uh, the top 2,000 sites from, this, from these data sets, uh, aggregated, and I broke them into TSS, so promoter versus non-promoter. And uh, I don't have the promoter showing, but for the promoter, what I found was that there was generally all constitutive. So the promoters that were bound by FOXB3 and Tregs were already accessible all the way up to stem cells. Okay? However, when I looked at the non-TSS, the distal OCRs, I found that there's two clear classes. A constitutive class and a dynamic class. The constitutive class, as you can see, is, is accessible starting from stem cells all the way down, even into non-T uh, cells like macrophages and B cells. However, the secondary class seems to have this dynamic fluctuation in the accessibility of these battle sites. So there's something clearly different about these Fox P3 distal OCRs between constitutive and the dynamic properties of the accessibility. I then looked at if maybe there are additional features I could look at uh, from the Treg data. So I looked at histone marks and Tregs and found that there's a predominant enrichment of H2K4 ME1, which is an active mark of enhancers. So all of these distal OCRs have H2K27 acetylation, which is a mark of enhancers. So these are enhancer elements. But H2K41 has been reported to be more of an active enhancer, an active mark for, for active enhancer uh, regulation. So um, we, we found a class of dynamic OCRs, FOXB3 bound, that have this active enrichment of H2K41. Is there any specific difference about the motifs or transcription factors that, that bind to these sites? When we look at the constitutive sites, we find enrichments for factors like ETS and FOXP, which have been previously reported in, in, in Samstein et al. However, in these active sites, we found NF kappa B enrichment. So NF kappa B is an important transcription factor in the active process in T cells. And so we think that these dynamic OCRs that have this change in accessibility primarily following the, uh, the exit out of double positive into mature into T, uh, C4 cells and thymus uh, are specifically enriched for NF kappa B. So this allows us to now start to, to think about FOXB3 cooperative TF regulation with certain factors to maintain kind of like a constitutive kind of regulation versus a more dynamic or active state with NF kappa B. So this is kind of the ability to take a, a rich resource like this in the toxic data that's very comprehensive, but then to ask very targeted questions about data that's only captured at one at one time point in the, in the differentiation. This is something about uh, how do you distinguish between dynamic regions versus your know, heterogeneity in the population you're looking at? So dynamic between yeah, this it, series? Yeah. <coughs> So we computed, um, actually, the differences uh, across the, so we, we, we plot this like a, a generalized linear model yeah. to look at the differences between the differentiation across, from stem cells all the way through T cells, to then ask if those dynamics were significant when compared to the dynamics <coughs> in the position. Am I answering your question, or? Okay, so you see the difference, but you don't know why there is, what's the source of that difference, the reflection of that different cells. So, so we think that these, we think that these OCRs are driven by active chromatin and also restricted to NF-kappa B. So we think that the combination of the epigenetic mm -hmm. and also the transcription factors that bind to these sites are specific to these. So one, one thing that's very interesting is that Tregs so the FOXP3 binding occurs here, 
and we see that at the double positive, there's something that starts to prime this change in accessibility, and we think that that's driven by the transcription factors in this axis. So there's a, a difference in the way that the accessibility arises in a lot, along the differentiation of T cells. You also have the lower paper try in the dynamic. Yeah. Which is quite interesting. Yeah. Have you placed the, the distance to the TSS to see if it's farther away from the TSS, shorter. and that's why you get to this? Um, I haven't, I haven't done that. So we didn't look at spatial um, distance of these enhancers. One thing I am starting to look at is um, <coughs> with additional data like high C or high chip is not to ask, okay, what were these sites? How far, far away were they from the TSS to actually pinpoint maybe the regulatory mechanism? So that would tell us more about mechanism of, of enhancer regulation in this, in this example. Okay. So the, the last few minutes, oh, are there any questions on the last couple of things I've talked about from Jen? Okay. Um, so we've been talking about accessibility uh, from many cells, from 10,000 to millions of cells. Um, and there's been quite a movement in single cell um, analysis and data generation. So in 2015, uh, the first study that came out uh, used a split pool attack seek strategy from Jason Dury's group using a specific barcoding of the transpososome. Um, within the same couple of months, uh, Jason's and uh, Will Greenlee's group uh, came out with this attack seek on the fluidine. So the difference here is that you're using a plate based system with the barcoded transposon. Here you're capturing individual nuclei into these uh, capture wells in a C1 machine. Um, and then there's chambers that allow you to do this uh, kind of like in a micro Eppendorf tube. Um, and then you can sequence and then uh, compare this, the profiles of accessibility, for example, captured in bulk versus single cell. Okay. And then the last one in single cell DNA seq from KG Zhao's group in Nature. And so you can see that. All these publications came out roughly around the same time, so they must have all known of each other's existence. Um, shortly after uh, these came out around the same time, uh, John Stam and Matt Milano published the cell systems kind of analytical preview uh, of single cell uh, attack seq and DNA seq uh, by comparing to what has been captured by ENCODE. Right? So ENCODE has done DNA seq on millions of cells and they did a, an analysis to show how sparse this data truly is. Um, and what they found was that the level of resolution that these two studies were able to show was on the order of hundreds of cells was only capturing 2% of what was known uh, to be accessible when looking at bulk measurements. Right? So this was kind of the first indication that this data was very sparse and that we are going to need many, many numbers of cells, much more than we would need for, for gene expression. Um, I think since then there's been lots of development and I think in the next year is going to be the year of a taxi, single cell taxi, um, with 10x and the Biorad Illumina platforms as well as a lot of the work still coming from, from Jason Dury's group in the split pool. Um, and I'm going to talk about um, the integrative aspect of single cell omics. I know David's also going to talk about integration, maybe not the single cell level, but we can start to think about uh, the problems that uh, can be lifted over from bulk analysis to single cell analysis. So there are two studies that I'm going to look, uh, talk about very briefly. So Lake et al. Um, did single cell ataxic and single cell RNA-seq in different, from different brains. Um, and then they wanted to integrate the two data types together. So the way that they did that was they used this gradient boosting model, so it's a classification regression kind of approach, where they started by first discriminating uh, the clustering of the cells into cell type A and B by expression. They computed differential expression across their clusters, and then used that as a classification to predict differential accessibility. Okay? And then they measured this stability assessment with the rock curve. For some, um, Clusters, so the bigger clusters seem to match really nicely and they can predict by expression the cells uh, with the accessibility jointly. However, when you look at the smaller clusters, their ROC curve seems, seems to be much worse. 
So what this is telling you is that uh, more input data is going to allow you to refine the clusters much better, which makes sense. Um, and so they're, they're able to claim that they can finally parse um, the attack seek space using gene expression or differential gene expression uh, using this kind of classification approach. So Benrostro et al, um, they measured single cell attack seek along uh, uh, myeloid differentiation um, and then also single cell RNA seq, and then they use pseudo time. Um, I think there will be some discussion on pseudo time. Yeah. Okay, but uh, very briefly, um, pseudo time can be described, if I can quote Cole, as an abstract unit of progress, and it's simply the distance between a cell and the start of the trajectory measured along the shortest path. So that's in short what the pseudo time actually is. Okay, um, and then they use this kind of pseudo time analysis uh, to map RNA expression of the transcription factor with its with its accessibility and find that it can be quite robust and have a high correlation between expression and motif accessibility, as we had seen with the bulk data. Okay? So that's kind of how they're doing that. So this is taking single cell RNA-seq and attack seq from different experiments, probably done on different days, and integrating them together. And then just this last week, um, Jay Shinduri uh, published this paper where they can use single cell RNA and single cell attack seq from the same cell. Um, and in this uh, example for this paper, they did they took these A549 cancer cells, treated them with uh, DEX, and then by RNA seq here you can find the tizny uh, for the gene expression, and they, they color it by the by the hour of treatment, and then they do a clustering analysis, and then because you already know which cell it came from, you can actually just color here and ask, well, what's the concordance of the matching clusters using this? And you can see that it's near perfect as you would expect. Um, the analysis in this paper was uh, very minimal in the integrative aspect, and I think that there's a lot still to be done in, in how to actually navigate this paradigm, right? So the idea you have single cell toxic and RNA seq from different publications, maybe, and then how do you integrate? And then also, how do you integrate from the same cell? And are, can those methods be applied for the same kinds of types of analyses? Here they show a very simple example where uh, they, again, use pseudo time. Uh, they look at the promoter expression and then the, exp the RNA expression, and they can see that it matches quite nicely, so both positively and inversely. And so, um, like I said, there's still really a lot to be done in, in, in asking kinds of integrative analysis or integrative questions for this. Any questions? How much more sparse is this data compared to the single cell attack? I haven't. So I haven't looked at that specifically, just because the paper just came out. And, uh, I, I read the paper and they say it's tenfold. Tenfold better? <laughs> Worse. Worse! <laughs> In the paper. So I, I wonder how many regulatory elements are you able to see? Yeah. It takes already I mean, that's a great question. I think that, um, again, there's still a question of how many open chromatin regions are you able to capture per single cell? when you have the aggregate estimate, right? Is it, are you capturing 10% of what you would observe in a bulk measurement? Are you capturing 90%? How many cells do you need to capture 50% of what you would observe um, in bulk? A lot of these analyses um, kind of gloss over that. Um, they do some of it, uh, but it ends up in the supplementary and then they don't talk about it much. But a lot of these questions, when you want to ask, am I capturing all the potential really important enhancers in my system, the dynamics, right? So comparing um, two different, two different uh, cell types is, can be easy, but what if you're looking at differentiation or, or something more complex with, with higher dynamics, right? If you're looking at branching of, of cells or do cells really branch? Those kinds of questions, of biological questions, I think that are still, still need to be addressed. And I think as more groups are able to do these uh, kinds of experiments, um, the, these questions will be answered. But there's still a lot, you know, it kind of shows you that there's still a lot of exploration left to do um, to really answer the, the tough transcriptional regulation questions. Questions? Okay. So, <clears throat> I just want to reiterate some of the conclusions and takeaway points and open it up if you guys have discussion or questions on some of the things that I've talked about. Um, so, like I talked about, I opened up with talking about DNAs and attack as measuring the state of accessibility, this openness, right? 
And we can get features like nucleosome information from this data. You can look at motif analyses. You can look at footprinting analyses. You can couple this with gene expression and chip seek to build networks. Um, you can look at open chromatin region uh, accessibility with gene expression accessibility to look at correlations. Um, you can use the proximity of these elements to start to ask, okay, is there a preference for distance of how far you need to be to regulate a gene? Um, so that looks at the long range information and, and gene connectivity kind of thing, right? So you can think about enhancer connectivity as networks themselves. Um, determining the function of SERs is quite tricky as we spend a little bit of time discussing. But systems like CRISPR and these NPRA activity assays are useful in kind of dissecting that. So you can start with mapping, right? So just doing a toxic DNA map mapping all of your open chromatin regions, then ask what function is there in these elements? Um, how important are they to my cells or to my system or to my development of my system? Um, and then, like I talked about fast growing, uh, single cell studies, we're going to make things a little bit more complex um, as we deal with the technical limitations, right? Uh, from moving from a bulk measurement to a single cell measurement, but would be useful in looking at the resolution, right? So, um, in terms of specificity of a, is an enhancer truly accessible in all cells that we think are the same? That's a very interesting question. Um, and maybe we can start to kind of look at function in that way, right? So if we take the same population of cells, we do a toxic and we see this enhancer expressed in all 100 cells, maybe that's the enhancer to start looking at for, for maybe its function. Maybe not. But these kinds of questions, I think, are going to be important for, for truly understanding the enhancer architecture. So I'd like to thank David and Satagra for having me come out and um, be here again for the second time. And I hope to be here for the third time if there is one. Um, I want to thank my advisors, Christoph and Diane, uh, all of the people that were involved in the InGen ataxic RNA seq study that I mentioned, um, funding from NIH, InGen, and then, uh, HMS. Any questions? I'd like to open up for discussion if you guys have questions about things. You can be Single cell level, uh, we can expect that uh, we can have some stochastic uh, at the OCR level also, uh, like yes. we have in, in, yeah. in gene expression. So maybe correlate those stochastic events. So, so I, I've in the initial. At this time, as soon as I saw these come out, we had a fluidine in my graduate study, so I did single cell toxic first Tegra. Um, and when I first saw the data, <coughs> I couldn't believe it because it was very, very, very sparse. So um, I was observing accessibility of OCRs in 2, two to 5% of my cells uh, that I thought were really robust in the bulk data. Um, and so, I knew at that time that anything less than 1,000 or 5,000 cells was, was just not going to be useful in, in that way. Um, modeling kind of accessibility as a stochastic process is going to be interesting. And whether or not, so one of the things I can say is that when you look at promoters, you can capture promoter accessibility in single cells more robustly than you can enhancers or distal OCRs. So that's actually going to be interesting. So the disconnecting the regulatory element based on promoter versus enhancer logic is going to be also interesting. Right? So maybe the promoter is really accessible across all cells, but the enhancers kind of are split. right? So maybe enhancer accessibility is more bursting than promoter accessibility. Right? If you can think about gene expression as a bursting process, um, maybe enhancer usage is also bursting. So there's a little bit of theory and modeling that one can do with these data. So it's, it's gonna, I think it's going to open up the field for some nice kinds of analysis. Questions, discussion, fears? I, I don't have a question. I sure. a comment that yeah. I think it was a great uh, talk. Uh, and I hope the students really realize how cutting edge and interesting this is. Thank you. So I will be 